Friends, back in 1963, a guy by the name of Butzi introduced an orthodoxy. He called it the Neun Elf. To you and I, it looked like a very odd sports car, but one with the engine in the wrong place. For 12 or so years, it worked just fine, but then the high priests at Porsche AG decided to introduce a schism, the Turbo Lada. It went on to becoming the most sanctified version of Butzi's orthodoxy, even to the point of winning Le Mans flat out. But now, fast forward to 2016, and well, times have changed since 1963. And now, even the most modest disciple of Herr Porsche's orthodoxy kommt mit zwei Turbolader. So, today you and I go on a quest to determine if the spirit of Butzi lives on in the Turbo New Order. I know I have told you guys this before, but you really do need to get your speak and spell, your etch and sketch out, because we have a lot to cover, and I promise you it's all very confusing. Uh, so let's unpack it, shall we? Uh, if you are a Porsche fanboy, you kind of already know what's going on here. Basically, Porsche took a perfectly good, naturally aspirated flat six that has been working for, say, 52 years and threw it in the trash bin. Instead, they have replaced it with a smaller flat six with two turbos strapped to it. Now, uh, we have a Carrera S here for really purposes of illustration, but we're going to talk about both the Carrera and the Carrera S. So things start with a three liter block with the Carrera. Uh, they strap the two turbos to it, uh, and that puts out 370 horsepower, all fine and good. But the torque, which usually is the problem of flat sixes and flat fours, uh, what they've done here is they've got up to 331 pound-feet of torque. Now, if you've driven any kind of flat six or flat four, you know that you really got to put your foot into these things to get torque out of them, like make them scream, which is not bad in these cases. But what they've done is they've tuned it to where the peak torque comes in at a stupid low 1700 RPM, stays flat all the way to 5000 RPM. So you follow me thus far, that is the Carrera. Now let's move on to the Carrera S, which this is. This is the more powerful model. So this has a three liter flat six. It also has two turbos strapped to it. It puts out 420 horsepower and 368 pound-feet of torque. So we got all higher numbers, uh, but now things get even more confusing because the torque comes in at the same 1700 RPM, stays flat all the way to 5000 RPM. So what's the difference? If the size and the turbos and all that kind of stuff is the same, what are we doing here? Uh, well, that's where Zuffenhausen has changed the turbos a bit in that the actual turbo housing is the same, but the actual compressor wheel, the diameter of it, is different. So it's actually bigger in this one, and thus that changes the boost pressure. So in the Carrera, it's 13 PSI, and this one, it is 16 PSI. Now we cover more changes to the engine in the tech review, uh, but really, how does this all translate out? Two there. So this is the point of the episode where you and I normally discuss like pulling power, pushing power, whatever you want to call it. But here I feel like it would be a waste of our time because we already kind of did the math: 420 horsepower and 368 pound-feet of torque. But really, what we got to focus on is this is about a 3,200-pound car. Now I have wisely chosen a manual transmission two-wheel drive, um, which gets us to that 3,200, a little over 3,200 pounds. So I don't think you and I really need to focus on, will this car get you out of a jam or is it quick? Because have a look for yourself. With or without the turbos, it goes just fine. What we need to talk about is something far more important. What we need to discuss is does it develop that power like a Porsche? Because if we're being brutally honest with one another, a Porsche is not a car. It is not a sports car. It, they have developed over the past 52 years a religion with these things. And it, here's a good way to put it. Now, I'm not, I, I don't want to get on to religious topics with you guys, but like I grew up in a certain church. And it was an old school kind of church with like a choir and a guy you know, an old guy in like robes talking in, in like foreign languages I couldn't speak back in the day. Um, but here, and that is the flat six, 52 years. But here they have introduced in the base car is a non-turbo turbo, if that makes any sense. So that's kind of like someone coming in with a rock band to the church I just told you about. And that's a little strange. So, number one, 
how does it sound? Because Porsches have a unique sound. So let's put our foot into this thing. And it sounds like the Porsche. Now, uh, we have driven a number of Porsches over the years. And basically what they've done is they, they, they pipe the, the air induction. So it's not the exhaust note. It's not like some like mechanized exhaust note that they electronically modify. It's the air induction that is piped into the car. And in this case, it's piped into the rear firewall. So you, I can definitely hear that. I've driven the thing now a couple of hours and I've heard it the whole time. And it definitely sounds like a Porsche. So check. But then there's two turbos. Now, somewhere along the lines of that Porsche religion, it was what, in the 70s, that they really got into turbocharging. So it's not like this is new, the, the, you know, the electric guitar in the church of Porsche. It's not entirely new, they've just refined it over the years. So how does it work here? Now, for us to understand that, I, I, we gotta try a bit of a different test. Not so much like, okay, let's downshift, put our foot into it and see if it goes, because of course it's gonna go. What we need to focus on is, is it gonna go when we do something to the car it's not expecting? So like, for example, let's slow down here. So I'm gonna bring it down to below 50 miles an hour. We're gonna go around a turn here. Let's put our foot into it. And we're in what? Third gear, let's go over to fifth. Now you've just handed off to another gear the car didn't expect, but the turbo's like, yeah, okay, no problem. We're kinda there. That's all fine and good, but let's try this again. Let's go down to three again, but let's skip a couple of more gears. See if we can fool this thing a bit further. And now we're in six. And there just there isn't an instance where the turbos are like, no, we got some other things to deal with. In other words, they're really, I, I cannot, I'm trying to find turbo lag with this thing, and I'm not getting it. A couple of years ago, I gave Mean Gene a 991 Cabriolet, asked him to put it on the rack. A couple of hours after that, he gave it back to me and said, this car is a bumblebee. Now, I looked at him as if he had been drinking again, uh, but the reality is he was right because this car shouldn't do what it does because the engine's way back there, much like a bumblebee. It's not designed to fly, but it does. So with this new engine, you're adding two turbos and a couple of other bits and all the cooling. That means you're actually gonna have more weight in the back. So what have they done to really address driving dynamics? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, number one, the block itself weighs three pounds lighter. The dry sump is different, that's four pounds lighter. But then moving forward, think about it, you got more weight back there. It's about, I wanna say 30 to 40 pounds heavier. Uh, so they had to recalibrate the suspension, both the springs and the dampers. But then really the biggest, there are two other really big changes here. Uh, number one, the ride height is significantly different. On all, whether it's the Carrera or the Carrera S, it's lowered about 10 mils. But then on this car, it's got a special like, sport like damper package, one of the many gazillion options you can get on these things, lowers the ride height even further. Then last, but certainly not least, uh, PASM is standard on all of these cars, whether it's the Carrera, Carrera S. So that's a pretty big change from the previous 991. Now that's in conjunction with, uh, you look at this one, it's got rubber 305 in the back. And if that weren't enough, there's another bit where you can raise the front of the car because now the car is now 10 mils lower at minimum. So you can raise the front here so you don't scuff the front bumper. Now, uh, they also have these on Lamborghinis too. That's a hell of a lot of changes to a company, an all new engine. But really to understand the impact of said changes on driving dynamics, you and I gotta unpack some 911 history or really that religion we talked about. So way back 52 years ago, Porsche just flat out put the engine in the wrong place. Um, but rather than admitting, yeah, the engine's in the wrong place, they just took 52 years to get to the point where the car was like, well, guess what? It might be in the wrong place, but it works. And really what they did was ever so slightly move the engine forward. Still in the wrong place, but it's more forward. And really the biggest jump was in 2012 when you and I drove the first version of the 991 that they put the engine an inch forward in one generation. 
So here we've added on turbos, which means we've added some weight, and yes, it's a smaller engine, but overall, that's an extra 17 kilograms hanging out in the wrong place. But engine placement does not driving dynamics make, at least not entirely. If you remember from the tech review, we went through a raft of changes. One of them was a recalibrated suspension. Now, to complicate things, all of these have PASM, right? Uh, well, this one's got this like special sport damper system on it, not to be confused with the sport package that gives you the sport chrono, the fancy mirrors, and the four-wheel steering, which sadly we do not have in this car today because I wanted the manual transmission, but we can still go around a corner like this. And this is even in the basic mode, fully composed, which you'd expect in a 911 but there's still a, just a wee bit more composure than the previous car. And that's a function of, yeah, the recalibration, which frankly, I, I gotta be honest, I don't notice a huge amount there, but what I do notice is there is significantly more rubber, like in the back, up to 305. So you're definitely feeling that, a little bit more grip going around a turn here, even in the non-four-wheel steering car. Now let's switch over to sport mode on the chassis, put our foot into it a bit more. The stability is even higher. It just makes it sharper. Like I told you guys, what, back in the 991 film, that they, almost the levels of a GT3, almost. And it's just that much closer. Friends, this is the point of our story where I have good news and I have bad news. Uh, let's start with the good news. There are three brake options on offer. Uh, option number one, which is really not optional, is the base Carrera, and that is a larger rotor, but it has a four piston caliper. Uh, then you move up to option two, which is the Carrera S. Once again, really not optional, it's standard. Uh, it is an 18% larger rotor, but a six piston caliper. Uh, then if you are looking to make a track machine, basically not use it as an everyday commuter car, uh, you can opt for carbon ceramic brakes. Uh, that is all the good news. Here's the bad news. Today I was given the choice of, do you want a Carrera S two-wheel drive with a manual transmission? Yes, thank you, I will have one. Um, but the bad part of that, this one is not fitted with the Sport package, which has the Sport Chrono, which we've seen in Porsche from like many years now, which uh, changes the mirrors very oddly. I don't quite understand that, but most importantly, this car behind us, is not fitted with a four-wheel steering system. So we'll have to come back to you, hopefully, with a Targa with a manual and the four-wheel steering system. Now we got another turn here. Let's downshift, go through it a bit faster. There's something else going on here, not just recalibration, not more rubber, you got ride height. So with all of the Carreras and the Carrera S, you get a lower ride height. When you get into that sport package, it goes down even further. But this one is fitted with an adjustable like clearance in the front. Okay, to really understand this, let's come to a stop, kind of in the middle of nowhere as we can do this. Please don't try this at home. There's no one behind me, no one in front of me. We hit this button here. The front end is being raised. Now it comes up 1.5 inches in total travel. And the idea is so you don't damage the front. As a Lotus lease owner, let's just say I paid a lot of money to have the front end fixed multiple times. So I really would invest in this. This is cheaper than the body shop. So I'm going, going, going. Let's pick up the speed. We're at 17 miles an hour, 18, 19, 20, 22, 27. And it's about 36, 37. Now the front end starts to lower. So it's hunkering down. Remember, we already have 10 mils lower, but now it goes even lower than the resting position, and that's to keep a lower center of gravity. And let's be honest, also a front end, free of your mistakes. So in summary, what do we got? To unpack that question, we need to look at this for what it really is. In the car world, this is referred to as a mid-cycle refresh. It means you get a new front end, a new rear end, maybe some tweaks in the engine, some tweaks in the suspension, maybe make the seats look a little prettier, and then you got an all new car and people will buy it. But frankly, and this is a Lotus guy talking, this ain't just a car, 
This is a 9-11, people. And I know this sounds cliche, but 9-11s, they're a religion. They've been around for 52 years. The only other cars that have been around that long is a Mercedes-Benz SL, a Mercedes S-Class, a Volkswagen Bug, and a Chevy Corvette. That is about it. If you really think about it, a Miata has been around for half that time. So when you look at it from that perspective, when you take an engine that has worked perfectly fine for the past 52 years for people who really don't care about fuel economy and put in two turbos to improve fuel efficiency and other things, well, then that's a big deal. And here's the thing about the big deal. Does it disturb the apple cart of the way it sounds, which is why people buy this, or the way it delivers power, which is why people buy this, or the way in which the whole thing works dynamically, which is the biggest reason why people buy this thing. And in reality, it doesn't. So yeah, I'd say it improves fuel economy, but that's more a function of Porsche corporate behind the scenes trying to hit cafe requirements in the US and other requirements in other areas of the world to sell more of these cars. But does it affect us negatively? No, it makes the car more efficient. It makes the car, frankly, better dynamically. So with that, I need to turn this around to you guys and we need to cover something incredibly important. The name of this car, because the 991.2 is terrible. Now, I know we're all into like our fanboy names, like, you know, R34, Skyline, that kind of stuff. But this, people, this is 911. This needs a better term, because turbos, you can't take that name from a Porsche turbo that's been around from the 70s, that used to have a just a ton of turbo lag, now it doesn't, and now is one of three cars on the planet from the factory that will go 260 in under three seconds. So with all due respect, you're not gonna put the name turbo on this thing. But at the same time, we can't just have this like amalgamation of numbers like everybody else, like Cadillac is putting weird names on their cars. So it's up to you and I to come up with a good name for this thing. So we're gonna throw out 991.2. And we're gonna come up with something like, I don't know, baby turbo or like uh, 20, I don't know. Come up with something. And what we'll do is we'll put together a couple, like a list of names and we will propose them to the folks in Zuffenhausen to come up with a better name than 991.2 because it's just bad. So let me know not only what name you want, why you want the name, so you gotta substantiate it. And you know what, three for, for really good measure, let me know if you've ever owned a Porsche and which one because that would have some help in getting the real name to Porsche. So let me know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV Award, Moto Man TV Award, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I want to leave you with two things. Number one, make sure you download our fancy new mobile application, uh, which you can get for free from Apple iTunes or Google Play. And number two, a fun fact. So there are a number of changes on this car, which, which, which we have gone through in a tech review and now this full first drive review. But one of the changes that frankly is the biggest is this color. Um, to you and me, that looks gray. But in reality, what Porsche calls that is blue. Until I see you next time, bis später.